welcome to Talbot Talks Think You. And today we are going to go over five general things that you need to know about neonatal red blood cells. The first thing I will say is that one of the things that you should already know is that what red blood cells do, and that is carry oxygen around the body. So I'm not going to count that as a general thing that you need to know because you should already know it. Okay, so let's start with the first thing. The first thing is let's talk about how red blood cells are measured. They are measured either with a hemoglobin or the hematocrit. That's different from how the white blood cells or the leukocytes are measured. The leukocytes are measured with how many white blood cells there are in a cubic volume. So if you go back and look at the CBC and the leukocyte videos, you will remember, or you remember anyway, that the normal amount of white blood cells in a term healthy newborn is somewhere between 5,000 and 30,000. So the white blood cells is measured in kind of thousands. There are way more red blood cells than white blood cells. So somebody a long time ago decided that obviously it was okay to discuss and study red blood cells if they're white blood cells, if they're in the thousands, but nobody wanted to walk around talking about red blood cells in their millions, because they're literally like 5.5 million red blood cells. Instead, the way that we measure the red blood cells is two different ways. The first one is with the hemoglobin, and that's literally measuring how much heme and globin that there is in the blood. And the hemoglobin is the component that carries oxygen, so obviously that is a necessary number. The second way we measure it is with hematocrit, and hematocrit measures the volume taken up by the red blood cells in the total whole blood. So if you again go back to the earlier video on the CBCs, then you will also see or remember that in 100 mLs of whole blood, so just so that we do that easier with percentages, about 60 mLs of it is going to be the plasma, like the fluid, about 1% is the buffy coat, the leukocytes and the platelets, and then about 40% is the hematocrit. I know you're all thinking that doesn't add up to 100, it adds up to 101, Ariana is doing that, but whatever, it's about those proportions. Generally, the hematocrit is the percentage of whole blood taken up by the red blood cells. Even though they measure two very different things, the hemoglobin is a grams per volume and the hematocrit is a percentage, we use these numbers very interchangeably in the NICU. And interestingly, they correlate very well. Generally, the hematocrit ends up being about three times the number of uh, the hemoglobin number. So for example, if you have a hematocrit in a newborn baby of 60, then you can expect that hemoglobin to be about 20. Remember that, it's a good rule of thumb. So let's talk about the number two general fact that you need to know about neonatal red blood cells. And this is, I'm sure, something that you know already, and that is that if you have too few red blood cells, then it is considered anemia. The official definition of anemia is when the hematocrit of a baby is at least two standard deviations lower than the average hematocrit for that age. Obviously, this is a very scientific way of describing something because we're human, and so obviously what may be a number that may be anemic for one baby really may be enough blood for another baby. So let's discuss the general symptoms of anemia. The first one is just the heart beating very rapidly, and this makes a lot of sense because if you don't have enough blood in your body, then the heart's going to try to get each red blood cell around the body faster so that it can deliver more oxygen. So a faster heart rate, obviously, is going to be a symptom of anemia. Being pale, you know, it's not important for the skin to get a good amount of blood and oxygen delivery. So it's, the body is going to remove the, the blood that's going to the skin. So you'll end up a little pale, the lips can be pale, especially the mucous membranes. So pallor generally is another sign. And then there are the more extreme signs of anemia. So for example, your blood pressure could end up being low. In a baby, they can very often have more difficulties breathing um, or even become apneic. And apnea is when babies like literally forget to breathe. And that is a very odd sign that babies can have. Generally, if adults are anemic, they're not gonna just randomly become apneic. But those are kind of like the worst signs of anemia. In babies especially, there are a lot more subtle signs of anemia as well. And probably the most important in a baby is the decrease in their interest in feeding and their stamina to feed. 
So if you think about it, the most complicated thing that a baby does is eat. They're not running marathons, they're not doing maths exams or whatever. So the process of eating takes up a lot of energy and a lot of developmental milestones as well. So they have to recognize their hunger, they have to be able to cry, and then once the bottle or the breast is brought towards them, they have to root, and then they have to latch, and then suck, and swallow, and during all this time they have to protect their airway and they have to pace. So it is probably one of the most exhausting things that a baby can do, especially in a, in a healthy baby. So one of the first things um, that will go is the baby's stamina to eat. So that could be a very subtle sign of anemia. Obviously, as a kind of corollary to that, if a baby is not eating well, then they're obviously not going to grow well as well. And if you think about it as well, if the baby is anemic, they're going to put all their efforts and all the oxygen delivery into staying alive, keeping the brain, the heart and the lungs going rather than concentrating on growing. The number three fact about neonatal red blood cells is this. The younger the gestational infant of the baby, the lower the hematocrit of that baby is at birth. So for a term baby, and term is considered anywhere between 37 and 40 weeks, though so 36 weeks and younger is, is, is considered preterm. So for a term baby, the average hematocrit at birth is 50. Whereas for an infant born at 28 weeks, who normally weighs about one kilo at that um, age, the hematocrit is somewhere between 40 and 45. Also, as each neonate gets older, whether they were born at term or whether they were preterm, the hematocrit slowly goes down. So really, the hematocrit during the first week of life for a baby, whether it's a term baby or a preemie baby, is pretty much the highest hematocrit that they're gonna have for absolute months. And that is because the red blood cells break down or they're disposed of at a faster rate than the bone marrow is able to make new red blood cells. So for term babies, eventually, obviously, there's going to be a point where the hematocrit is at its lowest before it starts going back up again. For term babies, they get the nadir of their physiologic anemia, and it's called physiologic anemia because it's completely normal. So even though the number sounds really low, it's still considered normal. And nadir means the lowest point. I don't think that's even medical. That just means the lowest point. Um, the, the nadir of the physiologic anemia for term babies is somewhere between six to eight weeks. So about two months of life. And their hemoglobin can reach about 10. So times three, the hematocrit. So with a hematocrit about 30. So between term, between when they're born at term, the hematocrit starts at 50. By two months of life, that hematocrit slowly goes down and it's 30 before it slowly starts creeping back up again. For a preemie baby who are way worse at making their own red blood cells and have lots of other reasons for why their red blood cells go away, one of which is kind of our fault that we're constantly checking their blood, right? We're like leaching them out. Their um, physiologic nadir is earlier, somewhere like three to seven weeks and their hemoglobin can drop a lot lower, really all the way to about seven. So that's a hematocrit of 21. The fourth fact that you need to know about neonatal red blood cells is that too many red blood cells is called polycythemia. So why should we even care about too many red blood cells or why should we care about polycythemia? And that is because of increased viscosity. So remember, the hematocrit is a percentage of the whole blood. So if you have a hematocrit of 40, then you're going to have 60% plasma, or about 60% of the fluid. If your hematocrit continues to go up, then you will proportionally have a lot less of the plasma. So it's very easy to imagine that as the hematocrit goes up, the blood itself gets much stickier, or scientifically, it gets a lot more viscous. And interestingly, the viscosity of blood starts to shoot up around a hematocrit of 60. So if you can imagine a graph, and hopefully Ariana and Justin will figure out how to draw this, but if you have a hematocrit on the x-axis and viscosity on the y-axis, then it kind of trundles along like this, and once the hematocrit reaches 60, 65, 70, the, the viscosity shoots up. So when it starts getting much more viscous, we worry about two main things. So the first thing is, is obviously the more viscous it is, the slower that the red blood cells kind of move around the body. So if they're moving around slower, then the oxygen delivery is gonna be slower. But even more scary than that, you can imagine that if the blood is like really sticky, then it's more likely to form little clots in the kind of tiny vessels, the tiny capillaries and everything. Where we worry about that most is the brain. 
So, and what would that be called if you ended up with like a small clot from the sludging in the brain? Yes, stroke, exactly. So you'd end up with a stroke in the brain. So obviously, horrible, horrible. If you end up with a little sludging in the, in the, in the lungs, then you can end up with respiratory distress. Um, also, just having a high hematocrit, you can very often in babies end up with a low sugar, just because the red blood cells are gobbling up all the sugar that you have in the plasma, and because the plasma is not distributing the sugar well enough. So lots of things that we need to worry about with polycythemia. So what do we do about polycythemia? What we do is we try to make sure that the babies stay well hydrated. That's really the most important thing. In the past, very often we used to do partial exchange transfusions, which is where we took out small amounts of the whole blood and then replaced it very slowly with small amounts of an isotonic fluid, normal, normally normal saline. Um, we've been doing that kind of less recently, just because the studies showed that it didn't really decrease the long-term, it didn't really improve the long-term outcomes in babies that had had the partial exchange transfusion done. So really the important thing is making sure that these babies do not get even more dehydrated. It's one thing having a hematocrit of 62, but you don't want this baby not feeding at all and the hematocrit shoots up to 75. And the fifth completely arbitrary fact that you need to know about neonatal red blood cells is that there are a few other tests that will also give you more information about the type of anemia and the type of red blood cells that the baby might have. On the CBC count, and you'll notice this if you actually look at the CBC that was sent up from the lab, there are many other values right under the white blood cell count, then it normally has hemoglobin, then it has, well normally it has white blood cell count, red blood cell count, which is in several millions, we don't really use that, then hemoglobin, then hematocrit, and then there are a whole bunch of other measurements, so MCV, MCH, MCHC, RDW. These all reference basically the different sizes of the red blood cells and kind of how much hemoglobin there is in each red blood cell. I'm not going to go over each one specifically because we don't really use them that much in the neonatal period. If you do have more interest, then please comment below and I will talk about them more. But there are basically three other tests that we use to diagnose different types of anemias or different issues that babies might have with their red blood cells. The first one is the reticulocyte count. This doesn't come up on the CBC and you have to order it separately on the retic count normally. And reticulocytes are precursors to red blood cells. So if you have a high reticulocyte count circulating in your blood, it means that the bone marrow is doing a really good job at trying to make new red blood cells. Eventually those reticulocytes mature into the red blood cells. So if you have a reticulocyte count of like 20, then the bone marrow is really ramped up and making loads of mature red blood cells. Whereas if your reticulocyte count is like 0.1, then at that point you can assume that your bone marrow is barely producing any reticulocyte count. So for example, if you have really bad anemia and you check the reticulocyte count and it's 0.5, at that point I would be very worried that the reason why I have the anemia is that the bone marrow is depressed because of a viral infection or a bacterial infection or that this baby is severely iron deficient. So that's the first test that we use. The second test that we use is a smear of the red blood cells. And that is literally, not a clever word, a smear of blood. And the pathologist can look down through a microscope and look at the different red blood cells. And in that way, they can diagnose a few abnormalities in the red blood cells. For example, there is a type of autosomal dominant disease called spherocytosis, where the red blood cells kind of look like spheres instead of like the nice concave, biconcave shape of and of, of regular red blood cells. And the pathologist can look at the smear and be like, oh, well, this is spherocytosis, and this is, you know, there are so, all the red blood cells look so round and abnormal. So that can be very helpful with the, those kind of slightly weirder issues with anemia. And the third test, which is specific to the newborn period, which is incredibly helpful because it's absolutely packed with information, is the newborn screen. So the newborn screen is a test done on every baby born in America. And it's a little pinprick that's done, a little uh, heel prick. Um, a small amount of blood is sent, normally at kind of a day or two, and then sent again. And it tests for a whole battery of different diseases that a baby could have. Most of them are genetic. 
One of those tests is a hemoglobin electrophoresis. So what that is testing for is the different types of hemoglobin that genetically this baby's ended up having. So on that test, that is where we would also find a diagnosis of sickle cell disease or sickle cell trait or alpha thalassemia. So that can be very helpful also because we're getting those results very quickly. We don't have to send it separately. That can be very helpful in figuring out the type of anemia that a baby has. So those are the five different general, completely arbitrary things that you need to know about neonatal RBCs. If you do have any questions about anything I spoke about today, or there are any topics that you'd like me to discuss in the future, then please comment below and we will get back to you. In the meantime, Justin wants me to point, which is really weird. In the meantime, like and subscribe. Apparently there's a subscribe button below. Thank you.